We will get started today. Is there anybody who needs the notes from last week? From last week. All right, the notes that I've just been passing out from last week, um, you would have these unless you've left them at home, weren't, weren't present for that session, or threw them away, or doodled on them. So I do have a few more copies if you need them, um, but, but I'm assuming a lot of you still have those. I think we will get in, I, I'm sure we'll get into the new lesson and so I have those up here, but I think I'll wait to pass them out until we actually get to them. Someone asked me to go through the fill-ins for last week. I think there was only one or two. Maybe just one. Lesson five. It's, you just passed it, I think. I think so. It's just the word damage. In order to accomplish the pro positive result of ending legalized racial segregation, damage was done to the United States Constitution. That's, so the fill-in is damage. And again, that that was um, the 1964 Civil Rights Act was obviously done for a good reason. It it accomplished something significant, but it did it, it did do unintended harm to the Constitution, and we looked at that last week. So we'll just pick up here today. We looked at Senator Merkley's letter. gave a I gave us a, a review of of that. Um, and so we are, I think, down to the section that says two constitutions, right? So let me just read a bit to you. Um, a number of scholars have pointed out that in reality, the United States today has... Is that a phone? No, I just turned it off. Oh, well, it was a phone then. Yeah. It made a very unusual noise that just kind of <laughs> threw me off there. All right. A number of scholars have pointed out that in reality, the United States today has two constitutions. Um, one given to us by our founding fathers, and the second established by civil rights legislation. And so there's a fill-in for you. This second constitution is established by civil rights legislation, whereby special legal rights are given to certain classes of people in our culture based upon race, sex, sexual orientation, or gender identity. Increasingly, when the original Constitution, when its first amendment guarantees of freedom of association and freedom of religion come into conflict with the new Constitution, it is the new Constitution that wins. So let me read a quote. Um, what I just read you, those are my words. Let me read now uh, a quote from Al Mohler. We're looking here at newly invented rights, and all goes so far as to say artificial rights that are now placed on a collision course and have an advantage over the actual fundamental rights that are explicitly articulated in the Bill of Rights in the United States Constitution. You look at the Constitution, you will not find LGBTQ rights mentioned, nor will you find anything that goes by any other name that comes anywhere close to claiming particular rights here. 
What you do see is a positive guarantee of respectful re religious liberty. But what we have seen is the world turned upside down and in the House of Representatives it was turned upside down by a vote of 224 to 206. Now that last state statement doesn't really add much there. He's, he's referring to the Equality Act and how that was passed in the House here. Um, and he's commenting on that. But the point that's being made there is, is the same point that I've just made. This, this idea of two constitutions, that was helpful for me when I, when I encountered that some time ago in, in a book that I read. And to just think through that and to recognize that that is a good way of understanding uh, the, the place in which we find ourselves. You know, we do have the Constitution established by our founding fathers and, and, and instituted through that legal process, uh, which guarantees religious liberty as our first freedom, among other freedoms. And then we have this, this, this seemingly second constitution, which uh, is pushing this agenda of, of sexual rights. And when these two come into conflict, increasingly in the courts and in, the, and in Congress, the, the Constitution, the first Constitution, loses when these two come into conflict. And so as I've said a lot of times, the, the issue is religious liberty and erotic liberty, and when these two clash, erotic liberty wins. Even though the original Constitution guarantees religious liberty, and it does not guarantee these other newly invented rights within this idea of a second constitution. So that's a pretty big idea, but I think it's a very helpful idea. And before going forward, I'll just stop. Um, first of all, do you understand this? I guess second, do you agree with it? Third, do you have, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying agree with it in, in you think it's right. I'm saying agree with the analysis. The analysis, that this is where we're at. And then um, just other observations that you might have. Um, about this. Is that, is that analysis helpful? Go ahead. Um, Kelly got us started on Hillsdale College uh, mm -hmm. class called Constitution 101. And uh, last night we finished up the eighth lecture, there's 12, and it was on progressivism. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. So pro progressivism is a movement that's associated with the Democratic Party. And um, I don't know what they said in the lecture, but you know, I think back in the seven, or 1870s, there was a spurt of this. There was another spurt in the early 20th century with like Woodrow Wilson all the way into FDR. And um, you know, the, the name suggests that we're, we're on this trajectory of progress. So it's a very it's a very positive idea. We're, we're improving things. We're progressing forward. Um, conservatism is the idea that we're trying to conserve the past and, and, and hold on to that which is right and, and going back to the Constitution in terms of our country. Uh, these are radically opposed ideas at this point. Um, and it, it, you know, it's, it's disturbing. <clears throat> Yes, and another, another disturbing part about this, and something you said just made me think of it, is that, say, the Civil Rights Act and the legislation coming after that, really, it, it does go back to, it, it, it really gets into the whole idea of hermeneutics, which is the art and science of interpreting a text. I mean, pastors and theologians understand this, because you, you take classes in seminary called hermeneutics. Um, because the Bible is an ancient text, right? It's a lot older than the Constitution, but there's some, there's some, there's some connections here that, that are the same. And, and so when you get into how do you exegete the Constitution, or what are the hermeneutics of exegeting the Constitution, to exegete means to bring out the meaning, to bring out the original meaning of the text. 
And what you, what you find is that whether it's the Constitution or whether it's legislation that's come in more recent decades, that there is not careful exegesis of the text. In other words, there's new meaning being poured into these documents. You don't find that meaning in the text. So an example of this that's really current would be um, like Title IX of the Civil Rights Act, uh, which if you look at the, the authorial intent of that, it defines you know, a woman as a woman, as a biological woman. But now Title IX's being used to justify transgenderism. And so a transgender woman is a woman, even though biologically this individual is not a woman, but is male. And, and so when you take a text and you realize that when Title IX was put in place, the, the, the drafters of that legislation understood the, wood, the, the word woman as it had been understood for thousands of years since the beginning of time. And now all of a sudden, you are taking that word and totally transforming the meaning of the word so that you're violating the, the authorial intent. You understand what I'm saying? Um, the legislatures who, who worked through all of that did not when they wanted to give protections to women, particularly in terms of sports, they understood a woman to be a woman. But now Title IX is reinterpreted so that a woman can mean a biological male. Now this is fundamentally dishonest, isn't it? And that in a sense is what is most angering about this is it is fundamentally dishonest. This is a lie. And it's a lie at the level of the people who are doing this. They know very well the authorial intent of the people who drafted that legislation back in the 60s and the 70s. And so they know that they are twisting the meaning of words. And, you know, honestly, I just, I don't think they care. Um, so, it, you know, hermeneutics and exegesis and some of the words that I associate more with the, the, the work of preaching... Because my job is to take a text and to the best of my ability to tell you what this text means based upon the original intent of the author. So today I'm asking the question, what did Paul mean when he wrote these words? And my job is to try to tell you to the best of my ability this is what Paul meant. Um, and when you, when you just cut the cord to the author's intent and just sort of plug in new meaning into a document that was not the, the intent of the authors, you've just, you've opened a box that you can't close that box. And quite frankly, I, it just, to me, it's, it's intellectually dishonest and it's fundamentally un-American. Because our Constitution means something. And if you don't like what the Constitution states, then what do you do about that? You amend the Constitution, right? Or you pass new legislation. And, and so, or, okay, or so often, you know, that's not what's happening, though. The courts have become very judicially active, almost like a, another branch of, of the legislature. Um, and it's just, it's just a really upside-down, backwards situation that we find ourselves in. I think absolutely. This is about power. This is not about being a person of integrity. This is about power. And so I remember many, many years ago, this goes back before some of the young folks were maybe even around, but when Al Gore and George Bush were running for president in one of the debates, and they were asked the question, how should we interpret the Constitution? And of course, their concern at that time was the abortion issue, which is still a concern. It's a huge concern. But George Bush, I think he spoke first. I don't remember this for sure, but I remember that he basically gave uh, what I would res what I would I would respect the answer he gave. Our concern should be what was the intent of the original authors. And then Al Gore gave his answer, and I remember this. I can almost quote this to you. And it sounds so good to a person who doesn't understand what he's saying. He said, we need to understand that the Constitution is a living, breathing document that must be interpreted anew for each and every generation. 
Now that does sound good, right? A living, breathing document. A person who doesn't know what's being said there could say, that sounds like he's showing real respect to that document. It's just not some dusty document we hide in a, in a vault someplace and ignore. No, it's a living, breathing document. But what he's really saying, no, we interpret it anew in each and every generation. What he's really saying is that we're going to play loose with the words of this document. And, and that explains a lot of where we find ourselves today. And quite frankly, this is getting off, t off our text for today, our, our subject. But this is why the Supreme Court matters so much. Because the Supreme Court, you know, you want people on that court who are textualists. Um, in the mold of someone like Scalia, who passed away a couple of years ago. You know, Scalia really understood and... And, and believe that you've got to interpret the Constitution based on the meaning of the words in the original context. All right? So this, this new Constitution, coming back to our topic today, this second Constitution really is it's, it's rooted in this whole way of thinking that, uh, you know, we've got this new set of rights, these invented rights, and we want to push these forward. And so we'll either overrule the Constitution or will reinterpret the Constitution, but either way, this, this new set of rights is in essence being placed over the original intent of the Constitution. Now, I mean, do you really believe that the framers of the Constitution understood that LGBTQ rights were in the document? Or that gay marriage was in the document? No, of course not. That, that would be completely foreign to their whole world view. And yet those, those rights have been invented and then discovered in the Constitution. And it, when you think about it in these terms, it really is a joke. It's pathetic and it's sad, but it is the reality of the world that we're living in. All right? I want to read to you before we, before we close this down and go on to a new topic, and this is going to take a while. Um, this is from the briefing of a couple of weeks ago. This again, this is Al Mohler, and I mention him from time to time. He's the president of Southern Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. He is, uh, so he's a Southern Baptist, um, a guy I greatly respect, and he does a podcast, which I listen to daily, called The Briefing. And this is from March 17th, so it's, it's uh, what's today, the 27th? 28. So it's 11 days ago. So it's, you know, in the, uh, in the passing of time, it's getting ancient, right? Because these things are moving so quickly. But it's, it's in reference to the Equality Act. And I thought what he had to say here is worth reading because there's some stuff here that, uh, that I wasn't aware of. And, and so let me, let me just begin reading this for you. And again, Al Mohler narrates this. He does this every day. He doesn't have any notes. It's really remarkable. But when I'm reading this, you've got to understand that, that I'm reading his spoken words. In other words, if you read something from a book, it's a little more polished, right? This, this is him speaking. And he does it without notes. He's just, he reads the news. He has some fo folks who funnel information to him. And then he just stands before the microphone and starts speaking. And so this is what he said in part on March 17th. The Equality Act would amend the Civil Rights Act of 1964, now we're, we're familiar with this, right? That's what we've been talking about. To include the entire array of relationships and behaviors and identities known as LGBTQ. Now, did the 1964 Civil Rights Act have anything to do with LGBTQ? Was that, on the, was that within the thinking of the legislatures who passed the Civil Rights Act? Would they have understood this? No, absolutely not. The Civil Rights Act had to do with race in America. And so here's another example of where you've taken uh, an act that doesn't have reference to what's, what they're pushing. And, and they're, they're just reinterpreting this. Well, actually, if the Equality Act passes, I, I will give them more credit. They're, they're going to actually legislate this. Um, okay. Behaviors, identities known as LGBTQ, and to put those identities alongside, for example, race and gender as protected classes against whom there could be no discrimination in employment, in education, in public funding. 
It would totally transform the United States as we know it. And one of the most important things for us to recognize is that this is a bill that represents a direct subversion of religious liberty. We have been seeing a pattern coming, a collision between the newly invented sexual liberties and the liberties that are actually enumerated, that is to say explicitly defined and respected within the United States Constitution. These newly invented artificial rights are pushing out the established constitutional rights and let's understand that the founders of this nation were absolutely right that religious liberty and religious freedom is the first freedom. It's not only first in priority, it is also the basic freedom from which all other freedoms are eventually derived. If you eliminate religious freedom, if you redefine it, if you subvert it, you are subverting all authentic liberties and all authentic rights. Now, I think what he means by that is that so many of our rights are pre-political. That's a big idea. The Constitution does not guarantee us our religious liberties. Those liberties are pre-political. The Constitution simply recognizes that these rights have been given to us by God. Isn't that what the Declaration's affirming? What, what's the phrase? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember it now. Keep going. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain in unalienable rights. Among these, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. They are endowed by their creator. That's the idea of a pre-political right. The Constitution does not give me the right to worship God as I choose in this building at this moment. The Constitution recognizes that I have that right. So my rights do not come from nine Supreme Court justices. They do not come from um, 435 representatives or 100, 100 senators or a president or a vice president. They come from God. And government is to recognize that they come from God. Okay? Um, now we've seen this collision coming. And yet we have also understood that the threat was coming from two important directions. One would be the courts and the other would be Congress. And in this case, it's Congress and the incumbent president of the United States, Joe Biden, who are pushing this Equality Act and it would utterly transform society because it would remove the right, for example, of Christian institutions such as Christian schools to operate on the basis of religious conviction. If you go back to the Obergefell decision from the Supreme Court, what year was that? 2015. 2015. And what did de Obergefell do? Same-sex marriage. Okay, that's so important. We need. It's like 73's Ro Roe v. Wade. 2015's Obergefell. You just you just need to know that and like memorize that. It's, it's that's such a big change. If you go back to the Obergefell decision from the Supreme Court, it was a 5-4 decision. Roe v. Wade was 7-2. This was 5-4. One justice made the difference. The or oral arguments in that case included an exchange between the Solicitor General of the United States. Solicitor General is a lawyer. I think he's number four in the Department of Justice. This is someone very high up in the Obama administration. And the Chief Justice of the United States, John Roberts, and Samuel Alito. So he's describing a conversation that took place during the oral arguments for Obergefell between the Solicitor General representing the Biden administration and the Obama administration, and the Chief Justice and the Associate Justice. It's two of these nine. When asked if the legislation of same-sex marriage by the court would mean that, for example, religious colleges that offered married student housing would be required because of the new definition of marriage to house same-sex couples, the then Solicitor General representing the Obama administration chillingly said, it will be an issue. Okay, he was at least honest. It will be an issue. That's another way of saying Yes, these colleges, they'll be in legal trouble. Well, of course it will be an issue, and it's already an issue. And we notice now what is coming along in the Equality Act is actually an announcement that religious liberty is being curtailed. 
That announcement comes not only in the redefinition of the Civil Rights Act, it comes in the fact that the congressional legislation now that has been passed by the House to the Senate explicitly denies the right of citizens to appeal on the basis of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Now this was new to me, I didn't realize this. You know what the Religious Restoration Freedom Act was? Hey, this is an act passed by Congress back, I believe, in 1993. And it was anticipating some of the things that are upon us now. And trying to guarantee that there would be protections for churches given what we're now facing. So he says, now wait just a minute. What's that? The Freedom Restoration Act was adopted by Congress and signed into law in 1993. It was remedial legislation. That means it was to correct an infringement of religious liberty that had, led, that had come by the Supreme Court in a 1990 decision. Now here's what you need to note. The Religious Freedom Restoration Act passed in Congress unanimously in the House of Representatives where the lead sponsor, you may know who the lead sponsor was? Yeah, not Biden, if someone said Biden. Chuck Schumer. You know, you know Chuck Schumer is, right? Democrat, he's now majority leader in the United States Senate, pushes the Equality Act. So the, the Freedom Re Restoration Freedom, Re the Religious Freedom Restoration Act um, that passed unanimously, the lead sponsor was then U.S. Congressman Charles Schumer, Democrat of New York, the current majority leader of the United States Senate, and by the way, a proponent of the Equality Act. But in one strange provision, by the way, this just tells you that politicians are pushed by their base. Back in 1993, it made political sense for Chuck Schumer to support religious liberty. His base pushed him in that direction. It no longer makes sense in 2021. His base is pushing him in a very different direction. But in one strange provision of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, and this is what I didn't know, the legislation said that it would be binding upon all further acts or bills passed by Congress unless the legislation explicitly denied appeal to the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Does that make sense? So when they passed this in 1993, they said, here's a caveat. This will protect religious freedom. It will be binding upon all future decisions unless a future decision explicitly says we are we are, um, the Religious Restoration Freedom Act is not binding upon this new legislation. Does that make sense? Okay. Does that not make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying though? It's a loophole. It's a loophole. Yes, when this was passed in 1993, it said it is binding upon all future legislation unless some future piece of legislation says we're not bound by this act from 1993. Does that make sense? It's important to understand this. So every new act has to go back to that. Every new act has to respect and conform to the Religious Restoration Freedom Act unless in this new legislation it exempts itself. So it's not binding. Yes. Is, it has to give itself an exemption. Okay. That's probably the best way of stating it. So I'll read this again. But in one of the strange provisions of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, the legislation said that it would be binding upon all further acts or bills passed by Congress unless that future legislation explicitly denied appeal to the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. That's what's in the Equality Act. Okay, it goes to the issue, is the Equality Act an attack, on, an attack on religious liberty? So the Equality Act legislation has that loophole within it, an exemption. Okay? Christians need to understand that the legislation that is now before the Senate, known as the Equality Act, actually not only includes no provisions respecting religious liberty, 
respecting the right of, say, Christian institutions to operate on Christian conviction, it actually goes further and says that Christians and other citizens can make no appeal based upon the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Now you understand what I'm saying now? This was news to me. So when Senator Merkley, our senator, that letter that I read to you a couple of weeks ago, he didn't tell us that, did he? Kind of conveniently left this out. That this act that passed in 1993, it was unanimous in one house. You got the Senate and uh, the House of Representatives, right? It was unanimous in one of those bodies. The other body had three no votes. I think in the Senate it was 97 to 3. This thing, this thing was a bulldozer. Nobody objected to it. Who was president in 93? Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton signed this into law. And so back in 1993, there was virtually no objection to this idea that religious liberty should be absolutely defended and protected. <clears throat> Okay. By putting that clause in there, they knew that obviously all the people that follow us will be well aware of that clause. You know, so yeah, we can support this because yeah. it's And so that, that is, in fact, what we're facing right now. Yeah. Okay. And, and I don't know. I don't know. That's a pretty jaded perspective to say that none of the men who voted or women who voted for that, even the most conservatives, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Did you say you're absolutely correct? <laughs> okay. Let me, let me keep reading. We're talking about a U-turn in American public life. We're talking about legislation, oh, here he says this, it passed unanimously in the House and by a vote of 97 to 3 in Congress in 1993. Congress has now reached the point where it is basically putting its own previous action on hold in order to push the LGBTQ agenda. Okay, but when they wrote the Equality Act, they had to write into it, this previous legislation has no, no, no merit or no binding. It's not binding. I'm skipping down a few paragraphs. And in the meantime, he's mentioned uh, David Cicilline, who's a Democrat from Rhode Island, who's from, in the House, he's the sponsor for the Equality Act. He's, he writes, but I really want to direct your urgent attention to a comment that Congressman Cicilline made when he was asked if this Equality Act would represent a challenge to religious liberty and to religious institutions. He said this, and I quote, the determination would have to be made as to whether or not the decisions they, they meaning churches, Christian colleges, Christian organizations. So I'll read that again. The determination would have to be made, made by who? Who makes this determination? The determination would have to be made as to whether or not the decisions they, religious people, could be Jews or Muslims too, are making are connected to their religious teachings and to their core functions as a religious organization or as a pretext to discriminate. Now, Moeller comments. Now, just pause for a moment. If you haven't heard anything else I've said, just understand what this congressman has said. He has straightforwardly said that if this act passes, it has passed the House, it's now going to the Senate, some agent of the government, some bureaucrat, some regulator, some judge, or some legislator, for instance, is going to have to make the determination as to whether or not a religious institution is making a bona fide religious claim based upon legitimate religious conviction in order to be understood as operating on the basis of some kind of legitimate religious liberty or to simply using religious liberty as in his words a pretext to discriminate. Now I am unaware to be honest of any precedent in this this is where speaking, he has a, his sentence kind of breaks off here. Now, I am unaware, to be honest, of any precedent in the entirety of American history where he's saying this would set a new precedent. 
I cannot imagine that in any previous epic you would have a member of the United States Congress dare to say that the legislation he has sponsored will put the government in the position of deciding whether or not, for example, a Christian college is actually operating on the basis of Christian conviction in its admission or hiring or student conduct regulations or student housing arrangements, or if it's just exercising some sort of pretext to discriminate. Sometimes you hear exaggerated language out there when it comes to threats from legislation or court's decisions, but let's be clear. If the government, government regulators, government agents get to decide when a Christian institution is actually operating on the basis of legitimate Christian teaching, then religious liberty is completely dead. Religious liberty disappears if the state is going to tell Christians what Christianity is. I mean, that, that last sentence, Religious liberty disappears if the state is going to tell Christians what Christianity is. And, and we're at a point now where, you know, this is, this is where we're at. All right. It would be interesting to know who it was that attached the caveat to the 1993 bill. Yeah. Yeah, you're assuming... You're assuming that was perhaps not in the original legislation that got added at some point. Yeah, and that would be fascinating to know that. Uh, that. And yeah, well, obviously, Chuck Schumer knew it was there, and that's how it got included in this one. Mm -hmm. How did he know it was there? Yeah. <laughs> All right, so how should we respond? I've got just four fill ins, and then we'll move on to the to a new topic. How should we respond? How, what would you say? You know, one of the things that is difficult with this class, and I think anybody who, if you listen to Al Mohler, you, you have to have a tough stomach. Because, I don't know if I've said this before or not, this is probably six, seven, eight years ago, I was up at Camp Ocana, and there were a group of pastors, and we were just in a casual conversation, and one of the pastors asked the question, well, you know, who do you listen to by way of podcasts? And we all shared, and, and I shared several podcasts, but one of them I shared, I said, I listened to the briefing. And this pastor rolled his eyes at me. And, and he didn't disagree with what was on the briefing, but his comment was, it's so negative. And it's just like, I, I, I just can't take it. I just can't take it. I can't listen to a steady diet of this. I think that was the point that he was making. But I've never forgot that comment. And, and what's proven to be true is that Al Mohler is, in my mind, proven to be very prophetic. You know, what, what he said seven, eight years ago, we're, we're seeing it happen right now. Nevertheless, it is true that, you know, if you listen to this stuff or you read these books and you think through these issues, it is hard. And it is discouraging. And I do get some of those questions coming back at me. You know, how, how can we make this more hopeful? And that's a hard, that's hard. Because, you know, the truth of this is, is so discouraging at times. It's like, well, how can we make this more hopeful? And I don't really know um, what the answer to that is. But, you know, in terms of how we should respond. But, yes. Yes. Yeah, and I do say to people that ultimately, if you theologically express this, I lean reformed. So I, I really believe in the sovereignty of God. And, and since I believe in the sovereignty of God, although I have down days, you know, I sometimes get up on Monday morning and I just, I'm really said, it's, there's been some Monday mornings when I want to go drive a truck, you know? <laughs> And I'm not alone in that. I mean, a lot of pastors can struggle on, you know, Monday mornings. Um, so I can have some down days. But ultimately, if you believe in the sovereignty of God, you really do have to be an optimist. You really do. You, you have to view the glass as half, half full, not half empty. Because you really do believe that God 
is in control, that God is authority, that this story is going where God is directing it. Um, and so ultimately, Christians, if they understand their theology, cannot be a despairing people. And so that, that is a helpful thought. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's both. I just think, I think I struggle with how do we make a difference? You know, how, how do we, you know, and, and part of this class is trying to make a difference. Uh, I think we're doing more than just having me talking or a conversation here. We're trying to influence minds and hearts, particularly with our younger people. There are, there are some of you in the room. We're trying to influence your minds and your hearts, okay? Because we realize that every other source of information you're likely hearing from is saying the exact opposite of what you're hearing here. Well, it's like, it's like the colleges, you know, it looks like they're, they're out here by themselves. I don't see a whole lot of people uh, in Congress or uh, politically trying to help those people in the colleges. I mean, are we supposed to help them? Are we supposed to get on it? Yeah. We, we're not taking a step well, and what happened this week? Is it is it North Dakota? Christy Nome, where's yeah. she governor? Is is that South Dakota? You know what what happened this week? So one of you tell the rest. And that was that was significant. It seems to me. What what happened? Yeah, the state had passed and she was being asked to sign a piece of legislation that would protect women's sports and protect girls from transgenderism. It would not allow the girls into the, uh, the uh, biological boys, males into the locker rooms, onto the sports teams. And, and that passed through the legislature, legislature in that state. She was asked to sign it. The last moment she said no. And, um, and she's... And I don't know, we'll have to wait and see what happens. What I, I don't know. I mean, I'm disappointed that she didn't sign it, but on the other hand, she might be absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. What I actually heard her say, because I, I listened to an interview, and she said she would sign legislation that was K through 12, but not at the collegiate level, because the NCAA was putting great pressure on her that her state would suffer economically and, and athletes would not be allowed to compete. Um, and, and, so, and she's justifying that, saying I'm actually protecting women because you know, our girls, our women won't be able to go to tournaments. The NCAA will lock us out. And she also said, I won't, I won't fight a fight unless I can win it. And then that's where I had an objection. I think that there are times when you've, I remember years ago something that that um, Mark Hafner said to me. I called Mark Hafner with a theological issue in our church where I, was, where I was teaching something and I was getting a lot of pushback. And Mark Hafner, he said to me, he said, you know, sometimes you have to fight the fight. The fight is worth fighting. You cannot give up on this. And, and that's what I would say, I think, to her is that we don't know if, we don't know if she'd lose. 
There are other states that have passed similar legislation. I think there's maybe, a, I don't know the total number. There might be as many as 20 now. Idaho, I know, has. This will eventually go to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court still does have a, a, a conservative majority. It's a, been a growing majority, actually. So I don't know. To me, though, she, I think there was a lot of pressure put on her, and she backed down. And the same thing happened in 2015 in the state of Indiana when they tried to pass their own state version of the Religious Restoration Freedom Act and the NCAA and big business pressured Governor Pence and he backed down. So I think part of it is that politicians have to, on some of these issues, they have to say, we're gonna die on this hill if we have to, but we're, we're, we're not gonna back down. You say it's pressure from the left. From the left. Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's no pressure from the right. Yeah, and there's there's what I'm calling, um, pardon me, but I'm calling it the unholy trinity. It's it's the progressive agenda is one part of this. Um, it's big business. You know, the bathroom laws in North Carolina a few years ago, they were gonna they were gonna crush North Carolina because they wanted to restrict bathrooms to biological sex and the NCAA came in on that situation and so it's the progressives it's big business and it's the media and you could add some others to this but it's like these institutions which are so powerful they they you're right they are fighting this fight and I think that there's too many people that are just sitting down and not standing up Mm -hmm. He continues to write back, and him and Schumer are going to sponsor a new bill. And I've not got the chance to read all of it because it just came in. The other thing to realize is that Merkley had uh, presidential aspirations in this last election that finally dropped out. And I think truly that he has positioned himself as a progressive at this point in time to run for the presidency in, in the next election. Interesting. So that, that aspect of what can we do, I mean a simple letter to those people that represent us that are not representing what we believe is important. And I encourage everybody in the room to sit down and write a letter. Uh, it can be three sentences. It can be three sentences. Three sentences. That, that expresses what your objections are to the views that they have and the legislation they're trying to pass. Yeah. Something I've also read, which is just since we're talking about letter writing, and I think this actually makes sense. Oftentimes organizations, when they'll contact you and they'll say, they'll give you a link and they'll say respond to your representative, your senator, and you can do it really easy that way. I read somebody who made the comment, and I think this is probably true, he said it actually means more to a senator or a representative if they get a hand snail mail letter. Yeah. It's perfectly well called. We'll write you back. So why do you don't get anything? You get a canned letter. Well, let me give you the four fill-ins. Can, can I just say before yeah. you, you know, we're asking what can we do? Here's another, maybe it's not a novel topic. We're trying to plan a BBS this summer. Really the only impact that we can really, really have is on Stanfield and the surrounding areas. And I think mm -hmm. to me, that's how we can have an impact on people as a church if we get behind that thing and present the gospel through BBS, we get the families involved. I can't do a whole lot in Salem. I can maybe write a letter, but, but I can have an impact right here in this community. And I think as a church, we need to see that. That is what we can do to have an impact in these individual lives. Now, mm -hmm. it may still go and be a mess, but we can still present the gospel to them, and that's the only thing that's going to set them free is that gospel. And so I would encourage us to really support that. And, you know, there's the festival that's coming this summer. We need to support and really encourage those things that can have an impact on individual people's lives. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really where it's at. Are you still on the Echo School Board? Deal with all of these kind of issues. But I guarantee you, the school 
schools are. I'll not guarantee you what schools are. And what you see in the universities and hear about the universities are what you're going to see and hear in the schools. And if, and if you care about doing something, then I say go to your school board meetings. That's the first big, easy thing to do. Second is try to get on and get involved and figure out where they're at with their curriculum adoption, their textbooks adoption, and get in there and find out what's going on. Ask questions. Don't be crazy and accusatory, but go in there and say, I want to get involved. I want to know what's going on here. And not just two people. You know, make, maybe you find a group of people in your community that you think should go together, and you say, we all want to be on the, the curriculum adoption. You know, we want to understand what's going on. Here. And, you know, you have a perfect right to do that. You, you are not sticking your nose into somebody else's business. It is your business. It is your school, and it is your kids. And I absolutely think that that's a concrete way to get involved, because it, it's going to be pushed. I've been watching this stuff. I've been talking to people about it. There's various approaches to it. I don't know that it can just be stopped unless a lot of people show up. It's the only thing I can see that would help. But just sitting around and being upset about it is not going to do anything. And your administrators, whatever they are, your superintendents, your principals, and everything else. I get the sense in this county that the culture is somewhat all on the same page. But those people are under pressure from up above, from the Department of Ed, and every place else to do stuff. Yeah. And they don't have an answer for it. But if they have a group of people backing them up, they may make a little different kind of decision. And they may be happy to do it that way. Mm -hmm. So that's how you get involved. So both of you are saying one thing we can do is get involved at a local level. Yeah. It's more grassroots. I've been saying to my wife that I'm, I'm thankful that, I, that we do live on the edge of the empire. <laughs> no, we do. I mean, we live in a more rural area. And, and right now, that's, I'm glad for that because yeah. we don't have the same level of pressure here that they have in metropolitan areas but the, the legally we're still is vulnerable is it in those other places also you know COVID-19 has shown us how powerful government is right I mean, there's all these local school districts that I'm assuming that if they had autonomy if they had local control they would have made different decisions but they've not been able to make those decisions because it's coming from Salem or Washington DC and their hands are sort of tied and that's, that's a whole other story as to how it came to be that way. But that it is, it is that way, and that's part of the problem. Okay, let me give you the fill-ins. How should we respond? Commitment to God's truth. There's nothing in the Bible that is ashamed of the light. That's C.S. Spurgeon. I love that statement. I use it a lot. It's true. There's nothing in the Bible that is ashamed of the light. So what we've been talking about, you, when you apply this to pastors and to churches... I mean, there's a lot of pressure put on pastors and churches to not speak the whole counsel of God's word because that's going to offend somebody. And, and so I, I think that there's got to be pushback there also. There's got to be conviction. Uh, the next one, compassion for people trapped in lies. I mean, I think that's the balancing thought here. That's truth and love. That there are people trapped in lies. And when we get into transgenderism in coming weeks, we're going to really see that, particularly with young people. And we do need to have compassion for people who are trapped in lies. And we, we need to recognize that there is, a, you know, there is a spiritual force in this world, and there is deception and, and all of that. Number three, strengthen the church. There is a critical need for the church to do a better job of preparing our people, including our young people, for life in this increasingly secular culture. Phrases that I use, we need to deepen the church, we need to strengthen the church, we need to thicken the church. Okay, we need to thicken the church. And this, this class is an example of trying to do that. Um, we, we just can't do church. You know, it's, you, it's got to be more than one hour on a Sunday morning. I mean, your, your Christian belief system, it has to be strengthened in, in a variety of ways. Uh, number four, strategic engagement with the political process. I think that whatever political power we yet have, really should be directed at 
at combating the LGBTQ plus agenda. I mean, that, that's the thing that we have to fight, tooth and toenail. Um, and we just can't surrender on that. From a Christian worldview perspective, um, to equate LGBTQ plus with race is simply not valid. That's a category error. Race is the, the color of your skin. It has nothing to do with behaviors. LGBTQ is all about behavior. It's about how you're living and what you're doing. These, these, these two are not comparable. And, but yet they've been connected and then that must, we must push back on that and say that is not a valid comparison. Um, so I've got a table talk question. Should polygamy be a civil rights issue? Anybody want to comment on that? Depends on where you're coming from. What do you mean? Well, if you're a progressive, it's the same thing. Yeah. If you're conservative, no. Let me just ask, do you all know what polygamy is? I mean, it's, there's some young people in here who might not know. What is polygamy? More than one. Or more than one husband. So, so we right now have redefined marriage so that biological sex no longer matters, right? You don't have to be a male and a female. You can be two men and two women. And a lot of people in our culture would say, well, that's a civil rights issue. Stay out of it. What they do in the bedroom doesn't influence me. And so you're just a bigot if you interject yourself. Okay, so we've, re we've reassigned or redefined marriage in terms of biological sex. What about number? Because marriage has always been understood as one man and one woman in a covenant relationship for life. That's the ideal. So we've gotten away from the biology of sex. What about the number within the relationship? Anybody want to argue that we should support polygamy of various forms? It could be one man with two women, but it could be two men with three women, or it could be one woman with three guys. And you might say, as it was said back in 2015 when this was raised, you're just being an absurdity. This is an absurdity. It's not an absurdity. It's being pushed right now. And if you're not aware of it, you need to be aware of it. It is being pushed and there is nothing to stop this. Because once you open the door to all this other stuff, there's nothing left to stop this. So where do you draw the line? Okay, if you're sitting here today, and I'm talking directly to you, and your attitude is, Pastor John, I basically think you're a bigot. And I don't like what you're saying, and I don't really agree with much of this. Where are you going to draw the line? I'm asking you that. You're not going to probably answer me right now, and I, I'm okay with that. But in the privacy of your own mind, and when you think about this this week, where are you going to draw the mind? Do you support polygamy? Maybe you do, but I'm assuming that even Jeff Merkley will at some point come to a place where, guess what, he's going to discriminate. Jeff Merkley's going to say, I don't think that 50-year-old men should be allowed to marry 14-year-old girls. Well, guess what, Jeff Merkley? Based upon your own worldview, I submit to you, you're a bigot. And you're discriminating because that 14-year-old girl, she wants to marry that 50-year-old man. And who are you? Who made you God Almighty to say that she can't? Okay, and he'll, there's really no defense to this. Once you... Once you tear down an order that is rooted in what God says, then you have no place on which to stand. Okay, so I want you to think about those things. Where does this end? Why is there a plus sign at the end of LGBTQ? What's the plus mean? It's all the additional stuff that's coming. Okay, so something to think about. All right, well, we're going to close. We didn't get as far as we thought, but, um, but that's okay, I think. We're going to go into something next week really interesting. 
There was a book banned on Amazon a couple months ago. You might have heard of it, When Harry Becomes Sally. I got a copy of that book. I couldn't load it down on Kindle. Um, what I got, I don't know. I got the book. It, it was a strange download. I got it in a digital form and I actually had to print it out. Um, it is the best book on transgenderism I've ever read. I can see why they banned it. Because it is such a powerful argument. And so we're going to go into lesson six, transgenderism, believing what is contrary to fact. And, and we'll spend a couple of weeks going through that. And so that's the next direction here. And then we've got, well, we'll just keep going. All right? Any, any closing thoughts? Bill? This class next Sunday, Easter Sunday? I'm planning to have a Sunday school class next week. Do you, do you think that's a bad idea? Are a lot of you going to be gone? Yes. Well, it's, it's being recorded. So um, you can listen to it. But that's, that's at like 6.45, 7-ish. So this would be 8.45. What do you guys think? Should we cancel Sunday school? Scott? No, we need to end a little earlier because that will be a time that people will come to church that normally don't. Okay. So we have to end a little earlier. Should we cancel Sunday school? No. 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 Let's take a vote. Who wants to have Sunday school? Who's a yes? Who's a no? We're having Sunday school. I'm not, I'm not a Supreme Court justice. I don't overrule the will of the people. 